James Knight. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me here. Uh, I think compared to some of the other talks today, I'm going to take us into a little different direction and try to think outside of ourselves as a species and think of something completely different, but that we really depend upon. For me, this story kind of began in the way that this video that you're watching, Tiny. Um, you may at first wonder, what am I looking at? Bacteria? People? What's going on here? This is actually a colony of honeybees. And they're doing what honeybees do. They're talking to each other. They're communicating. And there are bees that are dancing and telling each other what direction to go, what distance to go, to find food for the colony that's collected. And not only is this inspiring, and you can see a student pointing out the bees that are doing the dance, it really is one reason why we're drawn to bees, because like us, they are a collective. And it's amazing the long history that humans have had where we've admired bees. And in fact, in many different cultures, bees feature in our creations, that bees help to create man, or in this case, maybe even more. Our history with the bees goes back for thousands of years, reaching back even to prehistoric times, in which we would collect, as you can see in this image from a rock clay treasure honey and wax from colonies that we naturally find in the environment. And in fact, this kind of collection still goes on in many places in the world. Um, these are photos from Africa from a friend of mine, but this occurs in Nepal and many other places as well. So what we are doing with the bees is still following that ancient tradition in some places, but that's increasingly rare. I think one reason why we have such a close relationship is that bees produce really valuable Things. Especially in a world before we had sugar and other things, they produced honey, they produced wax. And interestingly enough, honey is a very valuable substance. Not only is it sweet, but it's a natural preservative. In fact, you can use it as medicine, you can use it on burn victims, where it actually may be better than modern antibiotics. And this image, I don't know if you recognize it, this is Alexander the Great, who unfortunately passed away, and he was accorded a rare honor of the ancient world. He was buried in honey. And here you can see him in his crystal sarcophagus, completely surrounded by white honey, which is a fantastic natural preservative. Our understanding of bees, and actually how to work with them and cultivate them, goes back to ancient times. And so here, in this Egyptian stele, you can see a nobleman praying that his afterlife will continue to have honey. And showing the hives, and these look kind of like clay tubes that archaeologists can still see today, in which the Egyptians learned how to cultivate bees and propagate them. And by the way, if you're looking at this, you might think this looks more wasp-like than bee-like, but in fact, this is the ancient Egyptian hieroglyph for bee. So even back then, the Egyptians understood that bees are essential for agriculture, and they pollinate. But for us, it's much more than just that. If you remember the first video I showed and how I became fascinated with bees, in many cases, they're an allegory for human society. So here is the frontispiece of the Leviathan in which we imagine a collective, the people. And what are the people? The people are sort of this Leviathan, which is composed of small individuals, just as with the bees. And what we value is that they are actually fairly selfless and they cooperate in the whole. And this has not gone unnoticed. Many people throughout history, including Napoleon Bonaparte, noticed this. You might notice, what is this robe embroidered with? It might be a little bit hard to see. They're covered with golden bees, symbols of industry and cooperation that he wanted to propagate as an idea of what the human state should actually be. So I think that is one of the main reasons that we love bees so much. Now, of course, another part of bees is that they are part of our daily bread and honey, but in fact, nowadays, they contribute much more than just this. The value that we get from honey and pollen and wax from the bees is far less than what they contribute to agriculture. Everything that you see here is 100% pollinated by bees. For example, the almonds is worth $2 billion as a California crop, which is a nice part of our economy. In San Diego, what would you guess is the number one crop in San Diego? 
Avocados, exactly. It's worth more than $112 billion, sorry, million dollars last year. And it's all pollinated by bees. So these are some of the things that are bees directly do. But you might look at this next image and wonder, I don't think that bees pollinate cows. What's going on here? Um, in fact, bees pollinate other things more indirectly. So bees, in this case not honeybees, but leaf cutter bees are involved in producing seed for alfalfa. We don't typically eat alfalfa, but cows do. And so we get indirect profit from the meat of cows, and of course dairy profits as well. You've probably heard the saying that one out of every three spoonfuls is from bees. And if you look at the direct and indirect effects of pollination, not just in bees, but any kind of pollinator, that's roughly true. If you look at the supermarket, you can see any different fruits and vegetables, and then below that, the dairy aisle, uh, what we can get from bees. But I wanted to show you that this image shows something interesting as well. We know that bees are important for food, but not just any kind of food, some of the most valuable food, because these are foods that are disproportionately rich in micronutrients. I'm talking about vitamin A, vitamin K. If we didn't have bees pollinating this, we wouldn't have the apples that you see here, or, whoops, many of the other fruits that are now gone, or some of the dairy things that we enjoy. So it's not just nutrition, it's high levels of nutrition, and some of the special things that give us pleasure in life, like uh, macadamia nuts, if you happen to be a fan of those. Now, we obviously have a problem because bees are not very healthy. And you probably heard about the mystery of colony collapse disorder. The important thing to realize is it is no longer a mystery. We know why the bees are unhealthy. We know why they're dying. It's because of five basic reasons. First one that you see here is Varroa destructor. This is a mite, kind of like a tick, that sucks the hemolymph, the blood of bees, and transmits different diseases to them. The second is beekeeping practices. To create a crop of $2 billion of almonds, we have to truck hundreds of thousands of colonies every year to pollinate this one crop. Now, this is not normally what bee colonies would do. They don't travel around the United States. So they're packed tightly together. They have to endure diesel fumes and this long trip. And then when they get there, you can see this lovely image of a bee on a flower. This is an almond blossom. And you might think, well, how is this poor nutrition? They have this abundance of food. We're pouring it at them. We want them to eat it. But bees, like us, need a well-balanced diet. Imagine if you were only allowed to eat one thing in your life or for, I don't know, an extended period of time. You wouldn't be very healthy, and the same is true of bees. They need a diverse supply of different kinds of pollens and different kinds of nectar because there are different nutrients in these different plants. So because we're exposing them to these vast agricultural monocultures, they don't have good nutrition. In addition, we've gotten rid of a lot of natural habitat. There are no longer the flowers, the wildflowers, that bees used to go to. The fourth thing you can see here is pesticides and spraying. And that's something you've probably heard about a lot in the news, not only as it affects bees, but also humans. But today I wanted to focus on this fifth element, which is disease. And I'm going to focus on that. But if you look very closely, you might notice a tick purchased on the bee that has deformed wing virus, this disease, because these things are all synergistically connected. When you have one thing, like you're affected with parasites, you're more easily affected by pesticides. And so this is an important thing to keep in mind. Now, I wanted to talk today about a disease which many people haven't heard of, but it's something that affects the majority of managed bees in the United States every year, and it comes back no matter what we do about it. It's called nosemosis, and it's caused by nosema serrani, which is a fungal-like pathogen. Um, the nosema are part of the microsporidia, which actually also infect humans, but are only a problem in humans that have compromised immune systems, essentially. And in fact, something similar happens to bees. So here's the spore of nosema, and here's a microscope slide that shows what it looks like when you extract it from the bee's gut. It causes poor bee health, it causes dysentery in some cases, but largely its interaction with other things like pesticides with parasites causes bees problems. Now, there is a solution, or rather there was, which was this one antibiotic, fumagillin. Fumagillin is used in massive quantities every year all around the world. 
what would happen if you guys went to a hospital or any hospital and you only got one antibiotic and everyone got the same antibiotic and every year they had to keep on increasing it because the resistance increases. That's exactly what's happening. And in fact, Fumagillin is now banned in some countries and in some states, and it's becoming increasingly difficult to get. So we have led the resistance to this one antibiotic. And the question is, when we think about symbiosis, is there something that we can do that restores our symbiosis with the, bee, with the bees using a natural characteristic. I should say, before moving on, that symbiosis means when two species are mutually working together and mutually benefiting. So we get the agricultural pollination from bees, they get the food and the care that we have to actually propagate the species. But there's a problem here because right now we're in a situation which is not very sustainable. Okay. So, Back to nature, how can we find something that has naturally evolved? Because we cannot keep on throwing chemicals at every single problem that we have. Now, I think this is a great um, photo, or actually it's a photo of a famous cartoon in which you see Edward Jenner performing his classical experiments. He had the idea that if you infected people with cowpox, that they would subsequently be more resistant to smallpox. And if this rings a bell, this was the very first vaccine that was ever developed. And I think the cartoon is funny because people had fun with the idea of vaccines. This is really weird. What's going to happen? Are people going to turn into cows? Are cows going to burst out of them? And so this is a cartoon that makes fun of the fact. But the fact is this works. And we know that vaccination is highly effective and has largely led to the near elimination of major human diseases that used to kill millions of people every year. Now, insects, it turns out, also have an immune system. That shouldn't be a surprise. But what's amazing is that we now know that the insect immune system in honeybees, bumblebees, and many other insects can actually be activated. Now, we can't talk about it in the same kind of way. We can't say we're going to give a vaccine to bees, but we can say that we are priming their immune system. It means essentially the same thing. We can increase their ability to resist an infection when they actually encounter the pathogen later on. Okay. So this is the work of my first master's student, Matt Endler, who worked on this research. And what we're doing here is you might think this doesn't look like a beehive. And in fact, we're trying to create the most controlled situation, which is to raise bees in plastic Petri dishes inside sterile conditions in the lab where we can control everything. So Matt and the students would have the job of going in every day because in nature, nurse bees take care of the bees in the lab. Undergraduates like you guys <laughs> go in every day and take care of the bees. And you can't miss a day or else they're all going to die. So what we found is that if we took spores, we would kill them with heat and we fed them to the bees, which essentially is what most vaccines start out as, that later on when we feed them the live pathogen, they resist it. And so here's some data. The red bar shows you that the bees that didn't get the vaccine-like vaccine, vaccine -like treatment had about 250,000 spores per bee. But the bees that got the vaccine-like treatment later on when they were exposed to the pathogen, they had 91% average lower infection levels. And moreover, there was a decrease in 71% of bees that had any level of spores at all. If they even had one spore, we counted that as being infected. So it actually works. And in addition, we have a sense of what the mechanism is because we know that bees that naturally resist this disease, they have something called the toll antimicrobial pathway. Essentially, it's their part of the immune system that jumps in and kills the infection. Several genes, including abeacin and defensin that you see here, are known to be active in bees that are naturally resistant. And guess what? When we immune primed our bees, these two genes also were elevated in concentration. And this is before they ever experienced any live pathogen. So the next step was to actually take it in a more natural situation. So this is Alex Nexkovic. He's also a master student who was in my lab. And here we're feeding the vaccine-like treatment to larvae inside the comb. We place it back inside the the hive and we allow the nurse bees to take care of them. What we then do is the same experiment and we find that it works, that it reduces 
infection level, and we call this in vivo, meaning it's actually inside the biological organism, the bees, it reduces their infection levels by 45%. So not too bad. But again, think about this. We're not going to ask beekeepers to go and inject vaccine-like treatment into every single cell. There are thousands of cells in just one bee colony. So this led to Andre Rubinoff, who's my third PhD master's student to work on this. And he looked at adults. So this cute fuzzy bee that you see when newly emerged bees are out, they're kind of fuzzy and hairy. It takes a while for those baby hairs to wear off. And he would feed them the vaccine-like treatment. And then you'd place them in cages in, inside an incubator and see what would happen. And what he found is that it also was able to reduce their infection levels. So you don't have to immune prime just the young bees. You can actually immune prime the newly emerged adults. And the same sets of genes, including hymenopteusin, were also activated. All of these genes are known to be activated in naturally resistant bees. OK. Well, living in an incubator isn't very natural. So this is the ultimate experiment. And this was done by my colleague, Zachary Huang, at Michigan State University. We, he took newly emerged bees. He fed them the vaccine-like treatment. He painted them on their backs. Doesn't hurt them, but later on you can tell who they are. You put them back inside the colony. A few days later, you come back, you look for the bees that are marked, and then you treat them, for example, giving them the live pathogen, and you see what happens. And in this case, it worked as well. It reduced the levels of infection on average by 56%, and the level of bees that had any infection at all by 60%. So this could work. And this actually is sort of practical, because beekeepers often feed their bees. They feed them pollen patties. They feed them sugar solutions so they can survive at hard times of the year. And so this could kind of work. But it would require creating a huge amount of vaccine. So is there something else that we can do? We know that in theory, but it hasn't been shown practically yet, that honeybee queens, just like your mom, she can pass her immunity on to her offspring. And so the idea is, what if we could immune prime the queens, and then you just have to do it once. You would have a queen whose offspring would be resistant to nosema infection. Um, this could actually work because queens are reared and they're very expensive. Each queen can cost $35 or more. So there's actually a profit incentive for this. And so I think that in the future, um, this is a research area that we can think about. So I wanted to return back to the theme of, of this conference that I'm, I'm very happy to be able to close, which is what would Machiavelli say about all of this? Here we are. We are the top dog. We are on top of the world, literally. We own it all. We control everything. We have, through the Green Revolution, the ability to feed billions of people. And we do it with industrial agriculture, with chemicals, and with globalization. But this comes with a cost. And the question is, is it worth it? Is there something else that we can do? When the first people went into space and looked back on the Earth, they had a sense of amazing beauty, but also fragility. Because this, for now, is our one and only home. And not just us, for all life that is here on Earth. And so I think we have to move away from throwing chemicals on everything and try to think of a natural solution to take advantage of what life has evolved on Earth. And among that life, of course, are our bees. You may have heard it said that Einstein predicted, if the bees go extinct, humans will go extinct too. And actually, he didn't say that, although it's a great thought and idea. <laughs> but the idea is the same. We are in a symbiosis with the bees. We are together on this journey. And we need to find a way in which we can protect our planet, Spaceship Earth, using something that is natural. And what better way for this one disease, or even many other bee diseases, to activate the natural immune system, to turn to something which is a natural process and which we don't have to dump chemicals at. In other words, we need to go back to the balance of nature. Thank you. <laughs>